Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are joining us from today. Welcome to the last webinar in our series, COVID-19 Pre-existing Disparities Exposed. My name is Amy Hong, and I serve as the Senior Executive Director of Education and Engagement at the General Board of Church and Society, and I will be moderating this webinar along with my colleagues, Reverend Katie Monforte, our Education Program Coordinator, and John Hill, our Deputy General Secretary and Director of Advocacy and Organizing. For the past four weeks, the streets have been filled with people and voices demanding a just future. And it only seems fitting that we are wrapping up this webinar series also envisioning a just economy, a just society where racial equity is present and where dignity and rights of workers are upheld. Before I introduce you to our great panelists for today, I want to bring your attention to the agenda. After the panel discussion, John Hill will speak on what Church and Society is doing on this issue and how you can take action. During the panel discussion and the take action portion of the webinar, please feel free to type a question for our guests. To do so, click on the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen and you can put your questions there. The questions will be answered during the Q&A portion of the web webinar with Reverend Katie Monforte. And that will bring us to the end of this webinar and the end of the webinar series. I'm very thankful to introduce you to our panelists for today. Shayla Thompson is the Government Affairs Manager on NELP's Government Affairs team. NELP or National Employment Law Project is a national research, policy, and capacity building organization that fights to strengthen protections and build powers for workers, including the unemployed. At NELP, Shayla has provided training on lobbying with racial equity and how to effectively facilitate race caucuses. Her advocacy includes researching health and safety conditions in the meat and poultry industry and supporting legislative efforts to provide safer workplace conditions. She has also provided testimony, research, and legislative support for fair chance legislation, policies that provide equity in the employment process to the formerly incarcerated and those with records. Shayla is committed to infusing race and inclusion into policy advocacy and creating policy messaging that reaches all working and unemployed people. Before joining NELP, she managed professional development and training and social media campaigns for early child care providers, infant mental health specialists, and parents. Lily Roberts is the Director of Economic Mobility at the Center for American Progress. Her work includes a focus on raising wages, combating economic inequality linked to race, gender, and geography, and building wealth and stability for American families. That includes translating research into policymaking on minimum wage, unemployment insurance, and eliminating the wealth gap between Black and white Americans. Her background is in anti-poverty research. She received a master's degree in social work focusing on community development from Case Western Reserve University, and she was a Moorhead Kane Scholar at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And before CAP, she served as a case manager at a Washington DC social services nonprofit organization. So thank you both so much for being with us today. Um, we have a few questions for you both, but and then we hope that this will be a conversation. So feel free to contribute uh, to this time. Um, the first question goes to Shayla. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic in March, 37 million people filed for unemployment. Can you share with us what unemployment was like before the pandemic? Um, and we also learned from previous webinars that COVID-19 impacts communities of color disproportionately. Has unemployment also affected communities of color disproportionately? Thank you, Amy. Um, the short answer is yes, for sure. Um, but the, the Black unemployment rate pre-pandemic has been consistently higher than the, the rate of white people, normally twice the rate. And this two to one ratio has been in place for almost half a century. And the only time this was not the case was during the Great Recession. Even college educated Black folks are more likely to be unemployed compared to white folks with college degrees. And that plays out at every education level. Even in recent times of economic expansion, when unemployment has hit significant lows, Black people still maintain the highest unemployment rates. Black people are also most likely to be underemployed compared to their white counterparts, meaning that a person is unemployed 
working on a part-time basis, even though they are seeking and available for full-time work or someone that is available for work and actively looking, but may have given up due to not finding employment. Um, in late 2019, when Black and Latinx unemployment hit record lows, the rates were still higher uh, than the rates of white people. Black workers had the highest rate at about 5.7%, and Latinx people were at about 4.1%. About and just recently, in the midst of the crisis, uh, the Labor Department reported that 167 of Black Americans and 18.9% of Latinx were unemployed. Uh, Latinx unemployment hit a record high due to coronavirus and uh, they were found to be twice as likely to be laid off compared to whites during the pandemic. And a trend that we are just now seeing with the most recent jobs report uh, is that during the crisis, there were spans of time when Black and white unemployment um, began to even out. But now as states and the economy begin to reopen, that gap is already widening again and, black, and the black unemployment rate is beginning to increase. And then I, I'll also mention because I'm sure that many of you have seen all of the challenges that folks have had accessing unemployment benefits lately, the long lines out of the door, down the block, um, some not being able to access the system at all. In some states, they're dealing with really archaic computer systems. Um, I, I just want to note that this system was broken way before COVID hit, um, but unfortunately, it is often ignored until the country is in distress, which is ultimately too late. And again, uh, people of color are least likely to access these benefits. So what we're really seeing now, Amy, is the inequities that communities of color we're already experiencing being compounded. And I, I think unemployment is a really stark example of just that. Mm, thank you so much. Um, and kind of just going along with the theme, um, and this is the second question. Um, before COVID-19, there were 30 million people, mainly Black and Latinx folks, um, working in the service industry. And often they were overworked, underpaid, and underappreciated. And the pandemic has recognize these workers as essential, but not providing the necessary safeguards like providing adequate PPE and many lacked adequate benefits. Um, so our words say essential workers, but our actions implied expendable workers. Um, can you share the struggles of these workers before the pandemic and how the pandemic heightened their plight? And can you also speak specifically on how it impacted women? Sure, and, and you just touched on this a bit in your question, but Due to occupational segregation, women and workers of color have always been concentrated in jobs that are the most dangerous, the highest injury rates, lowest pay, and are often most at risk for anti-worker initiatives. Uh, this pandemic is exacerbating problems within communities of color. I feel like I've used the word exacerbating so much in the last three to four months, more than I ever have in my life, but it's because it's so valid and it rings so true. Um, problems within communities of color that have existed for many, many years due to environmental, political, and other facets of systemic racism and exclusion. Uh, black and brown workers are more likely to be in the lower paid frontline positions that are considered essential right now, like cashiers, while white workers are more likely to be employed in management and supervisory roles. And this is one of the factors in why uh, black and brown workers are less likely to be able to telework or work from home, which is another racial divide in the workplace. So in the cashier context, that means the long lines out of the door, the panic shopping, in some cases, especially in the beginning of the crisis, we just saw all out melee is being experienced uh, and managed largely in, in, in part by workers of color. Pre-pandemic, Black workers have been overrepresented in essential uh, sectors that have been written with misclassification issues, uh, sectors like trucking, janitorial, and home care. And really quickly, just in case anyone isn't familiar with the somewhat wonky term misclassification, is that is when an employer intentionally places a worker in a independent contractor, temporary, or part-time role in an effort to suppress their wages or deny them benefits that they would normally receive as a full-time employee. Uh, Black and Latinx workers make up about 26% of temporary agency workers, even though they're a smaller fraction of the total workforce. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just realized I didn't ask for my slide, but that's it's totally fine. It's nothing fancy. Um, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Um, 
Amazon, for example, concentrates almost all of their Black and Latinx workers in warehouse positions where people of color make up about 58% of all laborers. Um, Amazon hasn't re revealed the demographics of their subcontracted delivery drivers, but federal data shows us that carriers and messengers are twice as likely to be Black. Um, application-based jobs, um, sometimes referred to as gig work, have surged due to shelter in place or stay at home orders. So Postmates, Instacart, Uber, et cetera, are in high demand and these workers are putting themselves at high risk for exposure. And this is another uh, sector that is notorious and has been for misclassifying its workers. Black and Latinx workers make up almost 42% of the workers on these platforms. So not only were workers of color being wrongly classified, they're now being exposed to even higher numbers of customers, uh, responding to an influx of orders, putting their personal health and the health of their loved ones and communities in jeopardy. And women um, who as of last year, 2019, make up most of the workforce. And even with that happening for the first time in a decade, women of color still face higher disparities. Uh, also, even though women have become a substantial part of the workforce, we still do not make up a substantial amount of jobs that pay the highest earnings. Um, I'm sure my colleague Lily will, will give us some insight on um, wage and wealth gap disparities, but I will mention that women have also always experienced pay discrimination even before the crisis hit. So now in the pandemic, again, we are seeing how racial and gender imbalances are being amplified with Black and Latina women with the highest unemployment rate. Thank you so much. Um, and you already kind of touched on this um, regarding racial discrimination in, in the work field. Um, studies have been conducted that racial discrimination plays a big role in the hiring process. For example, employers not hiring or calling back applicants with ethnic sounding names. Um, data also shows that African Americans earn less, are quicker to be laid off, and slower to be rehired and less likely to be promoted. Um, currently, there is a growing call for the Federal Reserve to pay closer attention to the Black unemployment rate. What policies do you think should be implemented that ensures a recovery that's based on equity? Yeah, uh, slide please. Um, any policy that is implemented that will be based on equity has to center Black and Brown workers at the outset. This includes all of the traditional progressive economic solutions that we normally advocate for, many of them on the screen, but certainly not an exhaustive list, like a higher minimum wage, affordable housing, voting, healthcare, and even now, like you just mentioned, Amy, many are advocating for targeted fiscal policies as well. Uh, any benefits enacted in response to the COVID crisis should remain in place until the economy has made a full recovery, not sunset at the end of the year or even sooner for some benefits like unemployment insurance. We need policy solutions that include all workers and that include permanent protections, not just temporary or emergency responses. Equitable policy solutions include undocumented workers. Many were left out of the stimulus relief that Congress passed. Uh, no access to UI, stimulus checks, and not being eligible for many healthcare programs. So in order to have a truly equitable economy, communities that have been marginalized and subjugated must be the priority. And this looks like women of color being the baseline for any policy response, because like I previously mentioned, even before the crisis, workers of color have been relegated to those underpaid, low benefit or no benefit unsafe jobs. Equitable policy solutions will prioritize uh, communities over corporations and will always be people first. And this will really require an admission from policymakers that workers of color were always disadvantaged and never recovered from the last recession. So we must put them first in any future response as we quickly have moved into another recession and what could much likely be a depression for black and brown communities. So unless these communities are centered, a policy will have a trickle down effect which we know doesn't work and is still divisive. And throughout our history, policies uh, have been born from how they can best benefit the most privileged, often cisgendered, heterosexual, able-bodied uh, white men. And that is not only inequitable, but also feeds into white supremacy culture. So the reason why we've never 
uh, genuinely experienced a just economy is because Black, Brown, Indigenous, undocumented, and refugee workers have been disempowered. So by creating pol policies around the transformations of systems and not overall economic losses or gains, we are working toward liberating workers of color. And once these communities have access and equal opportunity, we then experience a recovered economy that benefits all of us, not just those at the top or that are the most privileged. Thank you. Um, and this question, you already kind of touched on it, but um, this pandemic has opened eyes to low wage frontline essential workers. Um, Aijan Pu, the director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance said that hopefully the cultural shift will bring about a policy shift in how we treat essential workers, that we treat them as essential. Um, and you touched upon it already, um, but what policies um, would bring about this change? And also, um, what role do we have as consumers? Um, what you know, consumer responsibility um, do we have that ensures that workers receive dignified wages and benefits? And how can we push for corporate responsibility? Sure. Um, slide, please. We need to value all workers. Um, domestic workers, for example, have long been undervalued both at the individual and structural level. Um, and this may have been touched on during previous conversations in this series, but I, I just wanna give uh, one historical tidbit uh, that this is the result of the intentional racist designs of labor policies going back to the New Deal. Um, when domestic and agricultural workers, jobs primarily worked by Black folks and with ties to slavery, were statutorily excluded from the Fair Labor Standards Act, which provides benefits and protections like overtime and a minimum wage. This was done to satisfy segregationist lawmakers and the Jim Crow South and what was often framed as a race neutral policy. Uh, while since corrected, these racist exclusions have persisted in the valuing of work. And currently we are still living and experiencing the consequences of these types of exclusive policy designs. Uh, consumers can play a large role in ensuring that workers are receiving the wages and the benefits on the job uh, by also um, applying pressure on employers and corporations that are bad actors. So a few examples. Uh, for household um, employers, there's a fabulous organization called Hand in Hand that provides tools on how to promote a fair workplace for consumers who privately pay a home care agency. Ask the agency what they pay their workers. For Medicaid funded home care recipients, advocate for better wages and benefits and for ins ensuring that public dollars get to workers. Consumers can check to see if a business is certified by B Corps meaning that they must meet the highest standards of public transparency, excuse me, legal accountability, um, as well as the company's impact on its workers, environment, customers, and community. Uh, right now, there is a consumer-driven uh, petition from the Center for Science and Public Interest, and they're asking consumers to demand that the largest meat and poultry processors issue statements that they will implement the worker protections in the Essential Worker Bill of Rights. And that's a policy proposal by Senator Warren and Representative Ro Khanna that is really a proposal of a, a, a menu of protections for essential workers. It includes everything from uh, paid sick and family leave, health and safety protections, premium pay, childcare support, uh, whistleblower protections, and, and more. Um, this is an industry that is notorious for worker abuse. It has one of the highest injury rates before the public health crisis. So, you know, consumers have rights in our, our community, our economy, excuse me, is 70% consumer driven. Um, so consumers have the right to know that the workers that are preparing your food before you buy it in the grocery store aren't sick, aren't working while injured, won't be fired or deported for speaking out about unsafe job conditions. Um, this is advocacy that consumers should certainly participate in. And lastly, I'll mention that consumers can use worker power advocacy as a guide to their demands, whether that is in policy or corporate responsibility. And we, we've seen this worker power really ignite during the pandemic. 
um, Amazon retaliating against a worker for organizing a work stoppage due to lack of PPE and hazard pay, and then, you know, them planning to smear the same worker by framing him as smart and, and not articulate as an example. In New Orleans right now, sanitation workers have been striking for weeks in a protest for higher and hazard pay and PPE. So consumers should listen to workers. They are telling employers and policymakers what they need and consumers should back them up by demanding the same. Thanks so much, Sheila. Um, Lily, the next set of questions are for you. Um, Wage disparities lead into wealth disparities. Um, can you speak on the racial wealth gap in this country and can you share some specific policies that perpetuated this gap? Sure, um, thanks so much for the invitation this afternoon. Um, and it's great to follow Shayla in this because she provided such an excellent orientation uh, to sort of the state of wage disparities and the state of employment in the US right now. Um, I think that provides us with a really good jumping off point to talk about wealth. And I will just couch this in the fact that my focus is on the wealth gap between black Americans and white Americans. There are different policies and different conversations to be had um, about Latinx Americans or Asian Americans or Native Americans. So when I say wealth gap, I'm typically focused on the black white wealth gap. Um, so I wanna orient us to the fact that the average white family has 10 times the wealth of the average black family. And the wealth gap persists even when you break people out by education level. So in other words, a white person with only a high school diploma still on average has vastly more wealth than a black person with a college degree. I always try to say that upfront because I think a lot of people conflate education with economic mobility and the ability to build wealth. And it's important for policymakers to examine where that assumption comes from um, and for all of us to recognize that um, while there are correlations, um, education does not automatically help people build wealth in this country. And when I say wealth, um, it's everything from um, the value of your home or your car, if you own those, um, as well as savings accounts and retirement accounts, um, sort of your net worth overall is how you can think about it. Um, and it also includes things like, you know, sort of the subtraction side, your debts um, or anything that's subtracting from the equity that you have. So I'm going to give a bit of a history lecture, and I hope that you will all be patient with me. There's another universe in which I was a I, I wanted to be a history teacher for a long time and that shows up in my policy work and it shows up in sort of the level of detail that I like to talk about. So when you asked um, about specific policies that created and perpetuated this gap, I really wanted to um, dig in here. So I hope you'll permit me some time on that. Um, so the original sin here, as with so many things, um, is slavery and that's an obvious statement to be sure, but when I'm talking about economic policy, we always have to start with the fact that white people stole other people's wealth. They stole land from indigenous people and labor from black people to create their own wealth with impunity for basically the first 250 years of their time on this continent. Um, people who were enslaved could only keep negligible wages in a very few cases. And in general, they couldn't own land, sign contracts, take recourse legally against white people, any of the ways that 19th century commerce happened. So you get into the late 1800s and you continue to have restrictions around access to education, occupations, legal protections, which really get in the way of the sort of founding myth of how economic mobility works in this country. This idea of you can come up by your bootstraps. Um, and that's something that's really restricted to white people and then immigrant communities who are increasingly coded as white um, into the late 19th century and early 20th century. Then we get into a period in which the federal government becomes more active rather than just um, enforcing contracts and waging wars, the federal government starts providing economic benefits. Today, what we would call the social safety net. So starting with veterans benefits, um, we see certain groups of people protected from individual or national circumstances that might ordinarily drive them into poverty. Things like um, old age or conditions of widespread unemployment. And in several cases, um, 
you know, Shayla actually mentioned uh, the Social Security Act, but in several cases, Black people are specifically and purposefully excluded from these policies. So, for example, um, the deal making in Congress during discussion of the Social Security Act meant that policymakers who wanted Social Security, they needed to get Southern Democrats on their side. So they exclude domestic workers and agricultural workers to industries that are predominantly comprised of Black workers from eligibility. And that's what gets Southern Democrats on board and what gets Social Security passed in the 1930s. So we start with exclusion of Black people from policies that prevent downward mobility. Then in the 1940s, we start enacting more policies that allow for upward mobility, but for white people. So sometimes that's by design and sometimes that's by quote unquote coincidence. Um, so for example, we have the GI Bill after World War II. Um, I like to use this as an example because a lot of people have um, family stories about service by their grandparents um, or parents in World War II. Um, many, many white returning soldiers, including those from rural communities, poor communities, um, and European immigrant communities use the GI Bill benefits to go to college. There's an enormous sudden increase in social mobility, um, and that is because a generation of men go to college. Um, but college access is restricted by race in the 1940s at nearly all colleges nationwide. Public universities in the South wouldn't integrate at all for another decade. Um, so some black veterans could still use GI Bill benefits at their local university or college, um, but they would have been restricted to the programs available um, at historically black colleges and universities, a handful of integrated colleges um, and then trade schools that are traditional that are um, specifically for um, black students because they also wouldn't have been integrated. Um, now HBCUs are really excellent schools um, and in the 1940s though they wouldn't have had many of them wouldn't have had professional programs like law schools or medical schools. Um, the example that I go to here is my own alma mater, um, UNC Chapel Hill, um, which was segregated by law into the mid 1950s. UNC's law school class of 1948 is famous for being almost entirely comprised of white veterans using the GI Bill. And there were two future governors, two congressmen, and three future chancellors of the university system in that class. Um, all of them were from humble backgrounds in North Carolina, but all of them were white. Um, in the state of North Carolina, research has shown that black veterans who were able to use GI Bill benefits for higher education were generally funneled by benefits counselors into trade schools. So you might have um, the child of a farmer getting a steady, well-paying job by getting a certification or going to an HBCU if there is one nearby, but it's not the same sort of huge inflection point for launching someone from poverty into the middle or upper class. Um, so now we come to housing and there are entire dissertations and books that you should read and classes that you could take about how housing policy leads to the wealth gap and how it perpetuates the wealth gap today. But two of the major buckets are restrictive covenants, um, which allow neighborhoods to enforce segregation by only permitting white homeowners to sell to other white people and redlining, which is a map making effort um, undertaken by the federal government. So the redlining was literally the process of drawing red lines around parts of cities where the most black people lived, telling mortgage lenders that it was risky to lend in those areas. Um, I really encourage everyone to Google mapping inequality, um, which is a project from the University of Richmond, and I can put that in the chat. Um, it's an incredible resource that includes maps from hundreds of towns and cities across the US. And I wanna emphasize that restrictive covenants and red linings were not something that was happening exclusively in the South. Um, these were common across major cities in the North and the Midwest um, and even in California. Um, and I also wanna make the point, I think we talk about redlining and sort of conflate it with um, segregation. And we assume that it means that nobody would lend you or basically that it, it means that um, an area would be underinvested in. So sometimes people assume that redlining kept investors away. In fact, the opposite is actually true. So speculators would pile in 
um, to a neighborhood that had been redlined, they'd buy up homes and charge inflated rents to families because they knew that those people had few options. They couldn't buy their own home because the mortgage lenders wouldn't lend to black people. So white speculators flock into areas, buy up all the land and the houses and rent them out at really high rates. Um, restrictive covenants began to fall to legal challenges by the 1950s, and redlining was outlawed in 1968 by the Fair Housing Act, but the thing that we talk about with wealth is that it's transferred over generations. Um, so even policies that formally came to an end in the 50s and 60s still have uh, an impact today. And I want to illustrate that by talking about um, a real life example. It sounds very simplistic, but it's two actual people. So I'm gonna go back to North Carolina and imagine that we have two World War II veterans in North Carolina. One of them is black and one is white. And we can assume that they're from similarly poor economic backgrounds and none of their parents went to college. But it's the late forties um, and the white veteran is able to use his GI Bill benefits to take some night classes at UNC Charlotte. He doesn't get a bachelor's degree, um, but he becomes an office clerk and uses the GI Bill housing benefits to buy a modest house in an all white neighborhood. He has kids in the 1950s and those kids go to college funded by his steady paycheck, his savings account and the fact that he's paid off his mortgage by the 1970s. So those kids then become doctors and lawyers and they buy bigger houses in fancier all white neighborhoods. And then we go on down the line to today. Um, the Black World War II veteran also takes night classes in the 1940s, but at a trade school for Black students. Um, he becomes a barber, which is a really good job that pays good wages in the 1950s, but he can't buy a house um, because redlining and restrictive covenants keep him in certain neighborhoods paying really high rent. So he pays the high rent um, for his whole life. He doesn't accumulate equity in a home um, and he doesn't have a pension or a retirement account. So he doesn't have anything to leverage to then send his kids to college. And so, as I said, it's a really simplistic example. Um, obviously not everyone's life followed that trajectory but it is a real life story of two World War II veterans. Um, I realize I've been talking for a while but I also want to say that that's sort of the spiel up to here is probably the answer that I would have given three weeks ago. Um, it's a story, it's how I talk about the wealth gap sort of in general. It's a story that implies that basically well-intentioned white people made these policies, but because the system was already broken, because the maps were bad or because the universities were segregated, the good policy couldn't be the same amount of good for all people. Um, I think that lets modern people off the hook um, for not changing the system. Um, and it pretends that white people writ large didn't realize what was happening and didn't buy into that policy. Um, and one of the places that I've also been really thinking about how I tell the wealth gap story is that I think the economic policy community needs to think really critically in the role of white violence um, and state sanctioned violence in excluding people, black people from wealth. So um, we can point towards white rioters who burned businesses and murdered prominent citizens in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898 um, and in the Greenwood district of Tulsa in 1921. Um, the post-Reconstruction and Jim Crow um, eras saw an incredible destruction of property and life, particularly in parts of the country where Black communities were starting to build wealth. And that's also part of the wealth gap story, that people were building wealth and white people and law enforcement came in and took that away. Um, in many cases of lynching and white mob violence, the state and law enforcement directly participated or sanctioned that violence. Um, it was about protecting white political power and it was about punishing black accumulations of capital. Um, I think we in the economic policy community need to reckon with the fact that not only were lives lost to that violence, um, but we should consider lynching and the burning of black businesses explicitly as government economic policy because that's what it was. Um, I want to lift up the work of an economist at Michigan State. Her name is Lisa Cook. Um, she has an incredibly well-researched um, example of this. She estimates that each time there was an incident of hate-based violence, patent activity, so invention activity, and then the legal 
sort of structures you create to protect your invention, patent activity among black inventors declined by 15% um, every time there was an incident of, um, of racial violence. So creating an environment of fear where you don't want to draw attention, you know, you don't want to draw the attention of your white neighbors, where you spend your energy on keeping your family safe, those are things that would prevent many people from spending their time working on an invention. Um, and she's been able to quantify the economic reverberations of that. Um, think about the inventions patented at the turn of the 20th century that are the main source of wealth for modern white families. Um, and knowing that um, state sanctioned violence um, limited that for black families, I think is an important part of this story as well. Thank you so much. There was, that's there's a lot. Yes, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> but it was really helpful to kind of, you know, um, to kind of give us this full breadth and timeline. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, a recent Washington Post article stated that the racial wealth gap between whites and blacks in this country has remained stagnant since 1968. So meaning that there has been no improvements um, in reducing the racial wealth gap in the past 70 years. Um, there's also been a lot of conversation about how that has impacted um, communities during this pandemic. Um, how has wealth affected people's ability to respond to this pandemic? So Shayla did an excellent job talking about employment and black and brown workers, which is means that I can sort of move straight from, you know, take everything you've learned from her answers to these questions, and then we can talk about how wealth compounds um, all of those problems. Um, so without wealth and liquidity, um, you know, households that are facing unexpected financial shocks, for example, the disproportionate unemployment rates that Shayla talked about, you know, households may be unable to cover unexpected expenses um, and withstand long-term shocks. Um, many families of color report that they would not be able to pay their current month's bills in the event of a $400 emergency expense. Um, we actually just got new data this week that showed a really interesting um, look at spending patterns over the past couple of months. So for the highest income people, spending decreased by about one third of their typical spending rate in March and April. I see that in my own life. I wasn't buying coffee. I wasn't putting new money on my Metro card. I wasn't buying new work attire because I'm not going to an office. Um, but spending at the low wage end of the spectrum stayed almost exactly the same because life didn't change as dramatically for many low wage workers as it did for high wage workers. It's exactly what Shayla was talking about um, with, um, you know, needing to continue going to your job, not being able to work remotely. Um, we also know that communities of color, as you've talked about in previous webinars, have been more susceptible to the actual disease. Um, decades of all of the policies that I talked about have restricted people of color to areas with higher levels of pollution. Um, they've established structural barriers to the health system. It means that people have more, they're more likely to have chronic health conditions like asthma and diabetes. Um, and then also on top of that, they may, they're less likely to have health insurance um, because of occupational segregation um, and because we've tied health insurance to your job in this country. Um, so th all of these structural barriers sort of compound the economic impact they face. Um, we've also seen um, disparate outcomes in the response. Um, so we talked about, you know, the exclusion of undocumented people from many of the um, sort of interventions that were created by the CARES Act um, and by the earlier coronavirus response. But we also saw the implementation of the Paycheck Protection Program. It was really rocky. Um, and we know that black businesses were much less likely than their white counterparts to get access to loans um, and to other support for small businesses. Um, it's really crucial, I wanna echo that it's really crucial that we keep benefits available until the crisis is actually over, not just until the crisis is over for white people. Thank you. Um, so there is a, a saying that wealth begets wealth and poverty begets poverty. There's this generation cycle. Um, it can also be said that to confront the racial wealth gap that we need to address both the historical and contemporary causes of the wealth gap. Um, what are some solutions to address the racial economic inequality in this country? And, um, and how can we advocate for these changes? So um, it, working on increasing wages won't solve the wealth gap, but it would certainly help. 
Um, every day we set a new record. Um, we keep reaching the longest time we've ever gone since raising the minimum wage, since its introduction in 1938. So nationally, the minimum wage is 725, um, which works out to about $15,000 a year. We haven't raised the minimum wage federally since 2009, um, which as I mentioned, is the longest we've gone since raising it. Um, and in that time, minimum wage has lost about 17% of its purchasing power. So it's not even keeping pace with inflation. Um, the occupational segregation we've talked about a couple times today mean that Black and Latina women are clustered at the bottom of that wage spectrum. Um, so last summer, the House of Representatives voted to raise the minimum wage, but the Senate hasn't even brought that to the floor for a vote. So one thing to do um, is to get involved um, with organizations like Raise the Wage or Fight for 15 um, or groups that advocate for a higher minimum wage in your city or state um, or call up your senator and ask why they're not doing anything about it. Um, I also think that as a country, we're getting closer and closer to considering policies that will help us directly address the wealth gap. Um, so one of the questions in the chat that I saw was asking about um, affirmative action and reparations. Um, in my work, I try to move policymakers towards designing policies that will specifically tackle the black white wealth gap. Um, one such policy to point to, um, and I get this isn't explicitly reparations, but it's often sort of framed in that conversation. Um, we have policies like baby bonds, which are savings accounts for children that would be targeted based on zip code. Um, there are other policies that target um, zip code is a depressingly good proxy for race in this country. Um, and so we can, um, there are all sorts of policies in the education space and in the um, sort of direct support space that could target additional aid based on zip code. Um, I also think just sort of personally that we're a lot closer to having a national conversation about reckoning with our history and moving towards reparations than I would have expected just a couple of years ago. Um, you asked about advocacy and one of the, I've sort of spoken a lot about federal policy here. And one of the things that I try to keep in mind for my own life um, and for when I'm talking to um, audiences of people interested in policy is something to think about that might be uncomfortable um, is your school district and your zoning laws. Um, so as I talked about before, zoning looms large in how white people have protected wealth for ourselves over the past hundred years or so. Um, and because schools are largely funded by property taxes, schools that are quote unquote better are often the ones in higher tax areas and they're whiter. Um, I think it's becoming easier for white progressives to know about the history of redlining and to know about state sanctioned segregation, but it's still really hard to take a critical look at your own neighborhood. Um, who can afford to live in your neighborhood? Did you move somewhere that has a good school district? And does that mean that it's whiter than another district? And how did that happen? Um, are you advocating for affordable and dense housing in your neighborhood? What are your neighbors saying about efforts to build more housing or to bring people into a school that you are worried could change? Um, how does your church or workplace build relationships with the community around you? I think these are all really good conversations to have. I, I ground us in the history because it's an important story to know, but I think I don't ever want to sort of let all of, let those of us who have the privilege to learn about the history um, off the hook in thinking about how our own lives are perpetuating um, the inequality that we are still dealing with. Thanks so much, Lily. Um, listening to this conversation, I know that we are all wanting to act. Um, so John Hill, our Deputy General Secretary, will help us to do just that. Um, thanks, John. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, and thanks to Shayla and Lily for really such clear and compelling and challenging presentations on the realities of workers, especially the risk and pay disparities facing Black, Latinx, and women workers. Um, right now, we're all telecommuting, um, working from home. Uh, typically, Amy, Katie, and I work at the United Methodist Building directly across from the US Capitol. And when we walk in each day in the lobby, there is both our current social creed and the 1908 social creed which to me is a real powerful reminder of how our church has been witness 
an advocate for the rights of workers for um, really since the founding of the Methodist movement. Um, it's also quite frankly a challenge to me and a reminder of how far uh, we have to go, right? How much work there is yet to be done all these years later to live into those words, um, which guarantee a living wage in every industry and the protection and health and safety of workers. Um, so the question is really how we can fulfill this vision of an economy that truly values work, respects creation and honors the dignity of all workers. Um, I think we're grateful for the new consciousness by some, uh, by many really, of how dependent we are, how many of our lives from the food we eat to the clothes we wear, the deliveries we receive, that they're really dependent upon the hard labor of others, mostly the labor of black and Latinx and women workers, and that many of us in this time of social distancing are able to outsource the risk and we benefit from these systems that exploit, endanger, and oppress others. Um, so while it's heartening to see expressions of gratitude for the newly recognized essential workers, uh, we might see messages in the media or taped on windows. If we're really grateful, um, if we really value workers as essential, if we're truly faithful, we need to use our voices to demand change, to address structural racism, and to transform our economic models from ones that oppress and exploit to ones that actually build up community and share earnings more equitably. And we can certainly do this as consumers, right, in exercising our economic power to drive change, as Shayla pointed out. But we have to also demand broader structural change, uh, reforms to the economic system that would build a more just, equitable, and inclusive economy. Uh, so there are lots of ways to get engaged. I appreciated the um, encouragement from Lily to get involved in more local uh, zoning conversations. But today we're also inviting you to contact your members of Congress and to ask them both in short-term relief measures, which are still desperately needed, and in longer-term structural reforms that we really prioritize, as Shayla said, the Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and women workers, that we center the solutions around the realities of the communities of color that have been um, structurally left out for so long. Uh, we are asking elected officials to support a lot of the policies which our panelists have named from living wages, uh, ensuring safe working conditions, extended and exp expanded unemployment benefits and paid sick leave, kind of the core elements we need to rebuild an economy that more closely reflects God's vision of justice for all. So a link to this action will be shared with everyone who registered for the webinar. Or if you're joining us on our YouTube channel, you can easily find this action on our homepage, uh, umcjustice.org. And I will note that these letters are editable. So I would encourage you to add in personal perspective and stories that, that really help um, frame this from your perspective and, and as a constituent of the elected officials, and also to include some of what you heard and learned from our panelists today. So I'm grateful for everyone's willingness to join in this conversation and for your willingness to put your faith into action. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie so that we can have more conversation and question with our panelists. Thanks, John. And thank you, Shayla and Lily for just outlining so many ways for us to look at this, ish, um, this hope of a just economy. We have had listeners from across the United Methodist Connection um, just offering their insights and questions. One of the questions that arose in the conversation, um, Shayla kind of spoke about the power of voting um, and Lily spoke about how redlining and districting um, has impacted the vote. And so the question wanted to know um, how the vote and elections can help continue a more just economy? And how do finances in our elections kind of get in the way of that? And this could be for both Lily and Shayla, because um, you both spoke to different aspects of this. Shayla, would you mind going first? Sure, I'll take a stab at it. So <laughs> um, voting is, essential. And I think something that I have personally experienced, especially um, in recent years, are 
um, attention to smaller and primary races and how those really have an impact on communities. And I think, especially now um, due to where we are um, under this current administration and in this climate, folks are realizing what federal judgeships can do that in some, in some um, state and local um, communities, you can vote for sheriffs right now in a time where uh, state violence is at an all time high and we're seeing um, the uprising due to um, the killings of, of unarmed black folks. So I think that one voting for me, especially is something that I am, you know, I, I, I actually I don't condone, but I understand why some um, don't have a lot of faith in voting right now, especially seeing the suppression that's happening in states like, like Georgia and um, concentrated efforts, especially in the middle of a pandemic to have people go out and physically vote and dealing with really old systems. But voting is a tool that we have to continue to use, but we absolutely have to advocate for policy to address a lot of the historical and systemic um, designs that Lily kind of spoke to that have really brought voting um, and we're still experiencing those consequences now to this day and for us to really make voting equitable and it still is not in, in, in 2020. So I, I think that that's what folks need to really advocate for, not just um, in Congress, but also like at the municipal level. Yeah, to speak to the financing aspect as well, um, I think the the question the questioner's point that how can we expect um, good elections or elections that um, follow progressive values when you don't have a progressive system of um, financing the election um, and financing campaigns? Um, I think there are really interesting local efforts to try to make campaign financing more equitable and more accountable to residents and um, sort of put up fewer barriers to who can run for things. Um, I served as a local elected official in my neighborhood in Washington, DC um, for a term several years ago. Um, and it was a really wonderful experience, but I was really struck by the fact, first of all, it, it cost me quite a bit of money, of my own money to print out flyers. I had to take time off from work to go knock on doors. Um, I would, that we had events or, um, you know, hearings with the alcohol board or the zoning board in the middle of the day sometimes. And I was very lucky that I worked an office job that was flexible. And then we would have evening activities, you know, town committee meetings and um, community meetings that required people to, you know, they didn't need childcare. They felt comfortable leaving their house at night, you know, all kinds of things that are barriers to people. Um, and that experience for me really has, has stuck with me. Um, I know Seattle has been pursuing um, public finance models for campaign financing, um, and there are smaller communities across the U.S. that are looking into that as well. Um, so I would say that's something that's, that's really interesting. I would also point out that um, there's been some really interesting thinking about how the era of Zoom meetings actually may sometimes be more equitable for people able to serve as elected officials or participate in local governments. If you don't have to go somewhere um, because the meeting's on Zoom, um, there actually is some better access in some cases. Of course, the flip side of that is you have to have really good internet. Um, so there are all of these concerns um, and questions and I think a lot of local communities are grappling with that right now. When looking at the living wage and how it has not changed since 2009, what do you think some of those barriers are in um, Congress and um, barriers for us as local community leaders? What keeps us from advocating on a living wage? Lily, would you mind addressing that first? Sure. And I hope that Shayla will chime in because NELP is truly a leader in minimum wage research. I shamelessly crib from their research all of the time. It's, it's an, an incredible resource. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about, I, I am totally unbiased. I will say just go to the NELP website and learn so much about wages um, as well as other worker protections. But I think the thing that's standing in the way is that, um, you know, this isn't unrelated from the previous question. We have um, a system of legislators who are very disconnected from what it's like to work for 7.25 an hour. Um, many of them uh, 
you know, speaking of wealth, like many of them inherited positions in society where um, perhaps, you know, they look fondly back on like being a lifeguard for a summer, but like they did not have to support a family um, on minimum wage at the time. They did not have to um, view that as their only economic option for the rest of their life. Um, and I, I think we really get into a disconnect. I um, doing a lot of advocacy last summer um, with the House of Representatives, even um, people who purported to want to talk about, you know, affordability or um, other sort of things that, you know, even if their stump speech was talking about economic opportunity, um, they were really not quite clear on the fact that like, you can't rent an apartment for $15,000 a year. Like there is no zip code in America that's like so affordable that this is gonna be a fine wage for you. Um, and communicating that um, and what 725 buys um, was actually really important and, and really changed people's views, which it was sort of disappointing how simple that felt, but you know, sometimes you just really need to make it real for people to talk about, you know, I know you think that like rural Alabama is cheap, but like, it's actually not like you have to have a car because there's no subway. You have to, you know, you don't have as many rental choices. So you have to pay the rent that they're asking for. So what do you think 725 is going to get somebody there? Um, and I think talking about that in terms of real people's lives has been um, a real strength of the minimum wage movement over the past couple of years. Thanks. Thank you, Lily. And Shayla, if you could address that as well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, very much along the lines of what Lily just said, there is absolutely this myth that we should have like some sort of phased minimum wage across the country. And again, it has been a decade <laughs> since the federal minimum wage has budged. So if we would have kept pace with inflation, I think we would be at about $22 an hour. Um, and in future, in a few years, $15 an hour, even in Midwest and rural and some, some Southern cities will not be adequate. Even, even those areas will still need close to $20 an hour for a very modest lifestyle. I think again, there's this idea that yeah, well, if you live in DC or New York City or somewhere like that, sure, you need that because the cost of living, but we have to really go back to a decade of, stat, of wage uh, stagnation and, um, Again, the average person working for a minimum wage is a woman. It is a middle-aged woman. It is not a teenager that scoops ice cream after school. That is, that is I think that is like less, might be less than 10% of the folks work, working for um, a, a federal minimum wage. And then also one thing that I'll, I will quickly mention is the uh, sub- the, the tip minimum wage and the wage that is paid to people with disabilities, which is even lesser than the federal minimum wage. And the federal bill that we mentioned actually uh, eliminates that. What is very common, especially for women in the restaurant and service industry is sexual harassment. And tips have absolutely been tied to that. There's been a few articles and studies of women absolutely reporting, experiencing, and, and a lot of times dealing with harassment on the job consistently because their wages depend on it. Without it, they will not get those tips. So this goes again into some of the racial and gender um, and disparities that we spoke with earlier, but we need folks to know that 15 is barely chipping the iceberg. And again, like inflation and the cost of goods has shot up, but wages have remained, remained pretty frozen. And if I could just tie that back to um, something ar around the pandemic. Um, so we know that the restaurant industry has been incredibly impacted by um, the pandemic and by public health measures that have been super important in trying to preserve people's health. Um, one of the problems is that because so many servers make the sub minimum wage where they make about 213 an hour, which is wild. And then tips are intended to make up the difference. And sometimes that's true. And very often that's not true. But the problem is that their pay stub says 213. And many, many servers in this country can't get, they don't make enough to get UI. They don't get enough wages on their pay stub to make the unemployment insurance like lower bound. Um, so they're 
you know, they're out of a job, they're not making tips, and they also can't access unemployment insurance. Um, it's that kind of sort of combination of factors where we know the people that we've concentrated in these particular occupations, and then we treat them differently in all of the structures that, that rely on sort of the idea that they would have wages. Thank you both for your pointed responses and offering different lenses uh, through a voice of passion and experience and study. Thank you. Uh, Amy will transition us. Thanks, Katie. Um, a few announcements as we wrap up this webinar. Um, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic and calls for racial justice, uh, Church and Society will award special Just and Resilient Communities grants up to $10,000. The deadline for this grant is June 26, which is next week. Um, please visit the grants page on the Church and Society website page for more information. Um, the next announcement that we have is that next week, actually not next week, on June 30th, <laughs> about two weeks away, um, Church and Society will be offering a uh, film and panel discussion on voter suppression at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, the registration link for this webinar will be included in the follow-up email. In the next few days, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recorded webinar along with additional resources. There will also be another email with a link to a survey on the webinar series. Um, please participate in this survey. Um, it will help us create and design future advocacy and educational opportunities. So thank you in advance for participating in the survey. Um, thank you so much to Shayla and Lily for being with us today and for helping us to dig deeper into the historical causes of our unjust economy to know what needs to be fixed and how to go about doing the work um, towards a just economy. Um, just so thankful for your presence and for your work. Um, thank you also to all of the participants for being with us today and for journeying with us for the past five weeks. As this is the last webinar in this series, I'd like to conclude with a good word, um, a benediction. This was given by Bishop Woody White at the 1996 General Conference um, in Denver, Colorado. And we pray that this webinar series provided a stirring, a warming of the heart to not just imagine a just economy, a just community, and a just world, but that it moves us to action and to advocacy. So uh, let us pray. And now may the Lord torment you. May the Lord keep you before the faces of the hungry, the lonely, the rejected, and despised. May the Lord afflict you with pain for the hurt, the wounded, the oppressed, the abused, the victims of violence. May God grace you with agony, a burning thirst for justice and righteousness. And may the Lord give you courage and strength and compassion to make ours a better world, to make your community a better community, to make your church a better church. And may you do your best to make it so. And after you have done your best, may the Lord grant you peace. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, and please uh, keep in touch. Thank you all. Have a great weekend.